Shall we open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16? In our series that we've titled Key Questions in Scripture, we are now at that part in which we're dealing with doctrinal questions. Last week, we dealt with the whole issue of the afterlife and that if a man shall die, shall he live again? That is the crux of religion and is also, of course, the central theme in all of the Bible that this life is not all there is. There is another yet to come, and we must prepare for that. And now we want to deal with a question that's asked in the Bible. Jesus asked the question, and it's found in this text in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17. It's actually two questions, and so we'll be dealing with both questions. But primarily, the question for the title of the message this morning is, Who say ye that I am? Well, we find this in Matthew 16, verse 13. I'm reading, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Dear Father, I pray that we would look and examine, and, and Lord, that we would get the most out of this question today that we can. Who do people say that you are? And in particular, who do we say that you are? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the subject that in doctrinal language is referred to as Christology, that is the study of the person and work of Christ. And indeed, it is the most important subject of all of Scripture. What we know and what we believe and the Jesus that we have accepted is the most important part of our faith. The basis of the Christian faith is about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And if you are right on that, then you won't have much trouble being right on other things. If you are wrong on that, it doesn't really matter what else that you're right about. We must be right on the person and work of Christ. It is important that we understand who He is. Now, it's interesting to note that in both cases, the answer uh, was tied to a supernatural answer. Uh, when, they asked, uh, wh when He asked, uh, Who do men say that I am? Uh, they had to explain Jesus somehow. And do you notice that they had to go beyond the grave to do it? Uh, some said that you're John. Well, John had been uh, killed at this time. And some said that, that you're, you're John the Baptist, come back. And then others said you're Jeremiah or Ezekiel or one of the prophets. In other words, to explain Jesus, they had to go beyond the grave. They had to go to the land uh, beyond, or the realm beyond this one. Uh, Jesus was supernatural. There was no natural explanation for him. Uh, even Herod, uh, he said that about uh, Jesus. He said, he, he's John, come back. Now, Herod had killed John. And when, when he heard that Jesus did all these miracles, he said, it's John that he's come back. And that's why all these wonders uh, he's able to perform. And, and so it required a supernatural answer, even among those who were not his friend, even among those who had not accepted him, the only way they could explain him was he was su somehow supernatural. And of course, the answer for Christians that, that uh, Peter gave, he's, he's uh, the, the Messiah, the Son of, of God. So that's a supernatural answer. And, and so we want to look, first of all, at who do men say Jesus is? Now, there are various ways that people have tried to deal with the person and work of Jesus. And among those who are not believers, those who reject Jesus as Savior and have not become Christians, they have attempted various uh, ways of dealing with him as a figure. Now, the first one we're going to deal with is one that has been uh, discounted. Uh, it is uh, only a minority view. Uh, at one time, it, uh, people tried to give it some weight, but uh, the more they looked at it, the more they realized that this, this isn't going to work. Some actually said Jesus did not even historically exist. They, they said he's a mythological figure. He's like, you know, Tarzan or, 
or some comic book character or, or maybe, maybe he's like Robin Hood. Who, there may have been some version of Robin Hood through history, but is there a real Robin Hood? We don't know. Uh, they, they try to put him in the same category as mythology and say that uh, they made him up uh, from that religion that they created from whole cloth. And so some having dared to say that the entire biblical account of Jesus is made up, they claimed that there was no such person, that he was an invention of, of those who uh, had an imagination. And yet, the existence of Jesus as a historical person is, is attested to in secular literature. And the more we look at it, the more we uh, dissect uh, things that were written at that time, the more we realize, well, yes, uh, even those that didn't accept him as who he said he was acknowledged that he existed, that he was there. Now, here is an, uh, a quote from Josephus. Flavius Josephus was a historian who was under the pay of Rome. Now, he was from a Jewish background, and he understood the Jews very well. And uh, he wrote uh, some books, and in particular, these were antiquities, Jewish antiquities. And so this was a, a secular work in which he, as a contemporary uh, of the times of Jesus, right in that same time, wrote uh, this about him. He said, about this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was the achiever of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. When he was indicted by the principal men among us and Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him originally did not cease to do so. For he appeared to them on the third day restored to life, as the prophets of the deity had foretold these and, uh, and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day. Now, this is from a secular source. Uh, so for them to say that Jesus did not exist would be like saying that Julius Caesar did not exist or Plato or Aristotle or any of these did not exist. In fact, there's more historical evidence for the existence of Jesus than all of those others put together. In another place, Josephus makes reference to the martyrdom of James. And he said, who was described as the brother of Jesus? Uh, also, the scholarly consensus among scientists today acknowledges the historical existence of a man called Jesus who was crucified, but they still discount the miraculous aspects of him and consign him to some other category of human being. So the bottom line is even those who aren't Christians, even those who are secular, uh, they still understand there, there was a man named Jesus. Now, another thing that uh, people have tried to say to explain Jesus and why he was so famous and why he became so influential is they say, well, he was a, a Jewish shaman or shaman. That is, he had some kind of powers either through trickery or through some mystical powers that we can't explain. Uh, they don't call him God. They don't call him the Son of God. They don't call him Messiah. But they say he was able to do some things that were impressive, and so that's why he became famous and he gathered a following. And this is a spiritual explanation. They at least acknowledge that there's something supernatural about him. Now, there were those who hated Jesus in that day, and they would say things like this. He has done a notable miracle among us, and none of us can deny it. Now, these were people who would have loved to have found a way to discount what he did and say it wasn't a real miracle, but they couldn't. They had to admit there was a real miracle that taken place. Uh, when he raised Lazarus from the dead... Now, remember, he'd been four days in the grave. Uh, Jesus raised him from the dead. And so they, they knew that a miracle had taken place. And they said, well, we've just got to kill Lazarus again. That was their way of dealing with facts, dealing with the truth. Just bury it. Just, just kill him again. As if Lazarus hadn't had enough trouble already, right? And so they say Jesus was a Jewish shaman. Now, among those who believe Jesus existed, attempts are made to explain how he become, became so influential and of the many billions of people who have ever lived, few have made a lasting impact upon the world than Jesus Christ. Uh, you can take any character in the history of the world and say who has had the most influence and has made the, mo the greatest impact, and Jesus Christ is the greatest uh, among the, all the people of the world. And so they charge that Jesus was either a fake miracle worker 
or had some strange, unexplainable power that caused others to want to follow him and that they believed he was somehow supernatural. Now, as we understand, uh, Jesus' detractors, they tried to say that he did miracles, but he was a fake. Now, in Matthew 12, 24, here's what the Pharisees said when he was casting out demons, okay? He said, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So they were saying that, yeah, Jesus did miracles, but he did them under the power of Satan rather than the power of God. And that's a similar statement to saying Jesus was a great shaman, that he had some mystical powers, but we're not going to call him divine. Now then others might say that, uh, well, the reason Jesus was so influential and the reason that his name became so great is because Jesus was a revolutionary. He came in there with ideas and concepts that shook up the system and, uh, and, and he gained a following and it was a political thing. It was a sociological thing. And so they say Jesus was a, a revolutionary. And so this is a political explanation. Now, the, the, of the different ways that people can be influential and become famous and, and gain a great name, uh, these are those. You can have a, a spiritual explanation or a political explanation. Uh, we think of Confucius or Buddha. These are famous names, and they deal in the world of religion. But we also think of Alexander the Great and Napoleon and people like that who were political figures, military figures, and they achieved prominence and fame uh, and, and a following. Uh, and so they say Jesus was a revolutionary. Now, his name uh, is famous, and he did shake up the system, but let's rem remember something. Jesus refused to be made a king. At one time, his followers, they were going to make him a king, and he, he refused. He went away from them and didn't let them do that. Another place, they brought him a court case, and Jesus said, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Jesus would not even accept the position of being an arbiter in a civil matter in a local area. He, he did not come as a political figure. He did not come to hold office. I'm going to read you a, uh, the, the passage that we see about when Jesus was, uh, was being talked to by Pilate. Now, Pilate was uh, a political figure. He was a secular uh, governor, and so he's having this interview with Jesus. Now, now, let's remember something. Pilate is looking for a reason to justify crucifying Christ. That's what they're asking for. That's what the crowd wants. That's what it would take to make them happy. And Pilate would like to find some fault in Jesus if he could. So he has this conversation with Jesus. Pilate asked, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, what he is saying here is my kingdom is of another world, not this world, not this physical, political world that you're in. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. So he's explaining to Pilate, I am not a political figure. I am not raising up a group of revolutionaries. I am not out here to topple the public order. All right? But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came, into the, came I into the world, listen, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You know what Jesus is saying? He's already gone on record. My kingdom is not of this world. I am not seeking office. We are not fighting. I'm a king of truth. I'm a king of belief. I am an ideological ruler. That's what Jesus is presenting himself as. All right. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him at all. The one man in all the world who would have been happy to find some fault to lay at the feet of Jesus came out and publicly declared, I find no fault in him, not just politically, I find no fault in him at all. 
Now, Pilate, I believe, was impressed with Jesus' sincerity, with Jesus' holiness, with Jesus' goodness. Not only was he not a threat to Rome, not only was he not a threat to Pilate, but he was a king of truth and there was no fault in him at all. In other words, Pilate said, well, just let him go. (laughs) So now, was Jesus just a political figure? No, he wasn't a political figure at all. Now, he is king of kings and lord of lords, but that's when he comes the second time. Make no mistake, Jesus is a political figure in the future, but he wasn't now. He came then as the Lamb of God. He was not going to be in politics. He was not going to rule. He was not going to sit on a throne. He was reaching into the hearts of men where you live on the inside to rule in your heart. Now listen, you know what Rome got when Jesus taught they got better citizens. You know what Rome got when Jesus' principles were put into practice? They had better husbands, better mothers, better children, better soldiers, better stewards, better workers, better everybody. Listen, if you want to run a country with better people, Jesus is your best friend. If you want to run a society where people obey the laws instead of break them, Jesus is your best friend. This country, when it was founded, understood the principles of Christ, made a country stronger and better and easier to manage with less money and less officials and less government. And the more we stray away from Christ and His teachings, the more government, the more expensive it is, and the worse society becomes. Listen, the best thing government could ever do was allow the Jesus Christ movement to become rich uh, in their realm. And eventually... uh, Rome understood that. Uh, And so all the evils of the Roman Empire were replaced with Christian principles in time. So Jesus was revolutionary in a sense, but he wasn't a revolutionary in the political sense. Another thing that people say about Jesus, and, and they say this, is Jesus was one of many revelations of God. Now they'll give him that. They'll give him that he was religious. They'll give him that he was spiritual. They'll give him credit for having done something impressive and having taught some wonderful truths. But they do not want to accept him as who he actually claimed to be. And that is God the Son and the Son of God, the exclusive way to heaven. They write that off. And they say he was one of many ways to God. And yet what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so they claim that he's just one of many. Listen, of all of those that you could compare Jesus to, you could compare him to Muhammad. He died and stayed dead. You can compare him to Buddha. Buddha died and stayed dead. You can compare him to Confucius. He died and stayed dead. You take whatever religious leader you want to take, they all died and stayed dead. Jesus is the only one who died and came back in three days and is alive forevermore. So Jesus is not even to be compared with the others. Now, another one that they say, and this is one we're going to deal with a little bit, uh, you know, this morning, is that Jesus was a great teacher, tragically killed. That's what they say. Jesus was a great teacher, and then he was tragically put to death. You see, one of the things that can achieve, that you can achieve fame and a following and prominence is if you are really an impressive teacher, if you have a high intellect and have said things that were very wise, you can become famous. Solomon was famous for his wisdom. Uh, We think of uh, philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and and men like that who who achieved fame because of their minds and the things that they said and they got a following. And I've read a little bit of philosophy and they basically, uh, you know, rebuke each other and contradict each other. And a lot of it is just complete gobbledygook. Uh, Some of it is, eh, but the parts of it that that really make sense are just parts you can read out of the Bible or just think of on your own. So that is what uh, they experience with philosophy. And so that Jesus was a great teacher. Now, here's the problem. If you accept Jesus and if you want to revere Jesus as a great teacher, but you don't receive him as who he said he was, well, now you've got a problem. And I'm going to read you a famous quote from C.S. Lewis. Perhaps one of his most Uh, you know, famous quotes, and I think I may have read it before even in this pulpit, but in this context, I want you to bear with me and let me read it again, because it says a lot about this idea of uh, believing just that Jesus was a great teacher. Okay, here's here's what C.S. Lewis uh, wrote in his book, Mere Christianity. 
He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. And now he's going to quote what they say. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Now that's what they say. I, I believe Jesus is a great teacher, but I don't believe he was God. Uh, C.S. Lewis is saying, I'm trying to prevent you from saying that very foolish thing. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us. He did not intend to. Wow. What C.S. Lewis is saying is that if Jesus was not who he said he was, then he is a liar and a charlatan and should not have achieved any following whatsoever. So this idea, oh, I believe he was a great moral teacher. No, no, you, you can't believe that if you don't believe everything that he said. I believe what he said. I believe everything that he said. Now, let's understand something. Jesus was a great teacher. There is no question about that. There has been no teacher better than Jesus Christ. I often think, you know, Jesus, uh, what kind of teacher, what kind of preacher would Jesus has been, had been if he had gone to our modern Bible colleges and seminaries? Uh, they would have boxed him in so tight, he, he wouldn't have been able to teach very much. Uh, well, you know, Jesus, when he got up to speak, he'd say, consider the lilies. A sower went forth to sow. A man had two sons. Jesus told great stories. He made great truths. He was uh, someone that, that, that got you right where you lived, and he made good sense. Uh, he, he didn't do like I do with Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. And, uh, Jesus just told stories. He was the greatest teacher that ever lived. But he was more than just a great teacher. He was God in the flesh, uh, and he came to save us from our sins. And so certainly, uh, listen, Jesus, as, as great a teacher as he was, if he had not died, was buried, and rose again, he would have had a smaller following, and perhaps today we may not even know his name. He may have just had some obscure writings that we read about, or he may have been like Confucius, and we would have been reading some of the things that he said in fortune cookies or something like that. He wouldn't be the, the great influence that he is today. Why? Because he's more than just a great teacher. He is actually God the Son and the Son of God. Now we come to this. Who do Christians say Jesus is? Now, that's the real point today. The world may say all kinds of things about Jesus. There's all these opinions, all these things that someone may say. But it comes down to the same question Jesus asked his disciples. Uh, who do men say that I am? And they answered, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, and he gave the right answer. We're going to look at these answers. First of all, he said, thou art the Christ. That is, Jesus is the Christ. Now, what does that mean? The word Christ, Christos, in the New Testament, in the Greek, and, and all that, it goes to Hamasia, which we know as Messiah. That Peter was saying, you're the Messiah. Who do you say that I am? <clears throat> Peter answered, you're the Messiah. That's what he's saying here. <clears throat> now, what is, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> what, is the <clears throat> what does that mean when Peter said, you are the Messiah? Well, it means that everything that was said in the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be, that Jesus was that. That he was the one that would come and he would restore all things. That he would be the one who would come who would speak and be a spokesman for God. That he would be the one who would come and would be bruised for our iniquities and were wounded by his stripes, uh, were healed by his stripes rather, and, and that he was wounded for our iniquities. He would be the one that takes away the sins of the world. 
all of the Old Testament passages that had to do with Messiah, that Jesus was that. Now, he said, thou art the Messiah, and then he said, thou art the Son of God. Now, that was saying something. That was saying something. When Peter said that, here is what he meant when he said it. You're different than everybody else in the world. You are special. You are not like any other man. You are not like any other human being. You are not a son of God like we're all God's children. You are the son of God. Now, when he said that, <clears throat> he didn't get that out of a theology book. He didn't get that out of a Sunday school quarterly. He didn't get that out of a sermon he heard on the radio that week. There was no source for what he was saying there except God revealed it to him. That's what Jesus said. God revealed that to you. Peter just knew it. He knew it. He was in the presence of Jesus. He had accepted him, and he knew this to be true. You're the Christ, the Son of God. <clears throat> now, this is a title of deity. This is a phrase that implies and states that Jesus is deity, that he is divine. Now, we can go on and talk about other things in the Bible and other things that Christians say about Jesus, one of which uh, is next, that Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, this is important. It's important biblically, and it's important theologically that we understand this, that Jesus was unique. He was God, and he was man. He was both at the same time. He was not half God and half man. He was all God and all man simultaneously. They call this the hypostatic union, if you want a fancy theological name for it. Basically, he's the God man and the only God man that ever was or will be. Unique in his creation, unique in his inception, that he was the very presence of God the Son who left heaven's glory and came down to be incarnated, that is to become enfleshed and grew up as a man that had bones and skin and blood. Uh, he was a human being yet divine and apart from sin. This is who Jesus was. And it's important to believe this. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and we'll find out how important it is that this is true and that we should believe this. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here we find in the scripture, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, what he is saying here is that if there is a preaching, if there is a word, if there is a teaching, if there is an anointed speaker who can say Jesus is God come in the flesh, that he is actually in the, uh, in the flesh, you see, is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, one of the first things that people started doing with Jesus, even very early, just soon in the, in the first century A.D., the very earliest heresies were all about Jesus. He was God but not man, or he was man but not God. Uh, some had the presentation that he was really just a phantom. They just thought they saw him. It was a trick. His whole being was not real. Uh, and they, they had to do that because they had this difficulty understanding about the spirit world and the physical world being in the same place. You see, it's important that we understand that, listen, when it comes to Jesus, God came down. Heaven came down. And he was real. And he said, touch me, handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Jesus had a body. He was in the flesh. He could be wounded. He could bleed. He could hunger. He could thirst. Uh, Jesus was a, a human being. And this is important. I'll tell you why. We needed a mediator. We needed a redeemer. And Jesus, because he was God the Son, could take hands with God the Father. And Jesus, because he was a human being, because he was a man, could take your hand 
and reconcile you together in himself. That is what we needed, and that's who he was. He was man enough to die for us on the cross, but he was God enough to rise again and, and, and seal our redemption. So Jesus is God in the flesh. One of my favorite names and one of my favorite things to believe about Jesus is, is Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. You know, there's some words that are precious. Some words that have great meaning and great emotional matter to them. One of the words that I think has great emotional meaning is a word that we learn first as infants is mama. Mama. Boy, that's a precious word. It has such real meaning to it. I've seen grown men weep over their mother's grave. And they sound like a three-year-old. They'll say, Mama. Mama. And her memory and her sweetness and her goodness and her grace moves so upon his heart at that loss. It's a sweet and precious word. It is said that during the Civil War that men would be wounded and they would be on the battlefield between the two armies laying there waiting to die. And grown men would cry out and say, Mama, Mama. They just wanted their mama to put her hand on their forehead and, and to give her some comfort as they lay dying. But I can't think of any other name other than Mama that should mean more to us than the name of Savior. Savior. Listen, we were lost. 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 Apart from God. Condemned. Dirty. Judged. Dead in trespasses and sins. But Jesus came as a Savior, and He paid the debt, and He was our champion, and He went head to head with the devil, and He saved our souls. And that is a wonderful name about Jesus. And listen, we cannot allow any doctrine to exist that detracts from the value of the name Savior. When we make sin less sinful, we subtract from His name as Savior. When we make hell just a lukewarm place, or maybe some other thing other than the terrible place Jesus said it was, we diminish Him as Savior. Listen, He saved us from something. Jesus didn't come just to give us better ideas. He didn't come just to give us a better social order. He didn't come just to give us a better way to live. All of those things may be true. Jesus came to save us from hell and bring us to heaven. That's a wonderful thing. He's my Savior. And last, and here's where it gets really political. Praise God. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now make no mistake about it. Jesus came first, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey, riding in to submit himself to torture and death to save our souls. But when he comes again, he's not riding on a donkey. He's riding on a white war horse, and he has a vesture dipped in blood, and his eyes are bright and burning like fire, and he has a sword that goes from his mouth that is the word of God, and with it he will smite the nations, and he will defeat the Antichrist and his armies, and issue in a kingdom that will last a thousand years of righteousness in the earth. All the devils will be bound, all the animals will become tame, a child will be able to play over a snake's uh, hiding place, and uh, listen, the lion and the lamb will lay down together in peace. Listen, it's going to be wonderful. Now before, Jesus came and they wanted to make him king and he said no and he walked away from it. When he comes again, he's not, listen, when he comes down, he's not going to say, okay, we need to hold an election. I want you to set up voting booths. I want you to set up ballots. No. When he comes the next time, he's going to say, I'm here now. And here's how it's going to be. Listen, we've already proven we don't know how to run this world. 
If there's one thing history has demonstrated beyond all doubt, we do not know how to govern ourselves. You can take the best system you ever devised in the world, the best minds, the best intellects, the best geniuses, the most well-meaning men, and you can put that policy, you can put that form of government into practice, and believe me, men will find a way to ruin it. And we have proven that in this country. When Jesus comes again, he's going to say, okay, you're done. I'm here now, and here's how it's going to be. And here, you know what I want to say to that? Even so, come Lord Jesus. You see, we need to be saved from the governments of this world. We need to be saved from our own inability to govern ourselves. It'll be a lot more efficient when Jesus shows up. Taxes will go down. Crime will go down. The family structure will be strengthened. Marriages will be better. Children will be happier. Life will be better. For a thousand years, Jesus will show what this world can be like if you only live like God wants you to live. Longevity will be restored. The Bible says a child shall die at a hundred. Wouldn't that be great if a hundred years old somebody died? I said, boy, <laughs> they sure went early, didn't they? Now somebody makes it to a hundred, it's, you say, well, that's pretty good. I'm shooting for a hundred. Certain body parts are bailing out already. If I make it to a hundred, it'll be God's grace. I know that. But I've got a goal and I'd like to be playing. Uh, I'll probably have to go to catcher instead of left fielder when I'm a hundred. I'll probably be catcher by then. Maybe I'll have to roll the ball back to the pitcher. I don't know how long I've got on this earth and you don't either, but here's one thing I do know. When the millennium comes, this world for once is going to see what righteousness can be like. Won't that be a blessing for those here? Who is Jesus? That's the question. All the opinions of the world may come and go. All the different opinions and things that people may think, uh, let them have it. But here's the question. What do you believe? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Have you bowed the knee? Have you confessed with the tongue? Are you like Peter who could say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God? Uh, the Bible asks us today, Who is Jesus? And this question needs to be settled before you die. This question needs to be settled before the next life because it's too late then. Who is Jesus to you? If He is not your Lord and Savior already, you need to make Him your Lord and Savior. You will one day meet Him. You will one day stand in His presence. And here's what I'd like to see for everybody I know and love. I'd like for you to see the presence of Jesus and say, now I see you. I believed in you. I trusted you. I believe what the Bible said about you. But now I see you. And I will join with you in bowing down and calling Him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, you know what I believe? You can't say enough good things about Jesus that I'm going to say, wait a minute, that's going too far. You can't say enough good things about Jesus when I say you've exaggerated. You can't say enough good things about Jesus when I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it down. No, listen, anything you say about Jesus that's good, I'm going to say amen to it. Is he the greatest man that ever lived? Yes. Is he God in the flesh? Yes. Is he divine, equal with the Father? Yes. Did he die and rise again from the grave? Yes. Is he coming back? Yes. Everything the Bible says about Jesus, I believe it. And I want to preach it till the day that God no longer allows me to teach it. Why? Because I've answered the question in my heart, who is Jesus? And here's, here's the answer. He's my Savior. He's my Savior. Dear Father, help us. Lord, more importantly than being theologically correct, Lord, help us to be correct about Jesus. Because, Lord, if we're correct about you, our theology will line up. If we believe you are who you said you are, we won't have any trouble believing all the things said about you. We won't, believe, we won't have any trouble believing all the things that you said for us to do. Lord, we won't have trouble believing that you died and you called the church together to be your representatives on earth and to go out and preach the gospel and baptize and, and teach people to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Oh, Lord, help us to do a better job of that. Lord, help us to answer the question, who is Jesus, in every way we live our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing unto the Lord. Let's sing one of my favorite.